say they were winning the race They told me it wasn't no catching up But just like it wasn't no room in the caddy I had to lap them up Now I'm in the gym doing two a days Push, push, push Now I'm in the gym doing two a days Push, push, push And I'm getting money in any way All I know is going getting paid My moving weight like every day Now I'm in the gym doing two a days I'm in the gym doing two a days Push, push, push I'm in the gym doing two a days Let's run it up. Guys, this is Carl Reed here with my co-host, Carl Nunu Washington, with the Run Up the Score podcast. We have a very special guest on the day, um, an offensive mastermind, the wide receiver coach at the University of Hawaii, Brennan Marion. Brennan, thanks for joining us. Appreciate you having me on, Coach. Anytime you can get on with a legend, it's, it's big. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't do me like that. Hey, hey, hey. You, you the legend now. Let me tell you how legendary that Brendan Marion is, guys. So two years ago, my offensive coordinator, Kyle Wagner, shout out to, to, to Kyle. He's not a head coach at Ridner. He walks in my office and he says, we, we got to you, you got to watch this. It's this guy named Brendan Marion with the go-go offense. We got to run this. We we got to – and so, you know, I'm a devout wing T guy, right? And so he was really, really pressing me on the go-go, on the RPOs, on Gus Malzahn, on all this. And so we started really diving into you, and we actually ran a lot of that. Um, and so that's kind of how I started following you, and I became um, really familiar with who you were and what you were doing. And obviously, we're going to get into some of the things you've accomplished in the accolades. But before we dive deep into the go-go and all that, can you just give the listeners, for those who don't know about you, and most people do, but for the guys who don't, you went through playing at JUCO in California, playing at the University of Tulsa, coming through high school. Kind of give everybody a brief intro on your background and how you got into coaching and how you ended up where you are. Uh, I think for me, I've always been a big, big faith guy. My grandma put that in me as a young age. And football for me, it's kind of always been a big deal. I'm from Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So, you know, football is everything in Pittsburgh. If, you, if you're if you a boy and you don't do – I remember in ninth grade, I told my mom, like, I'm not trying to play this year. And she was like, well, you can get the hell out of my house. So, <laughs> you know, football is a big deal where I'm from. And always growing up, I was always at the Steelers training camp. Uh, when we lived in the projects, I would – wake everybody up in the morning and, and create the teams. And we'd go take our team and go down the street and play somebody else. And at recess, you know, I was always kind of coaching before I even started coaching, you know. And when I went to, to junior college, kind of how I got my first taste of coaching, our coach left. So I went to one junior college. We were, like, ranked nationally. And uh, I struggled there, you know, coming from Pennsylvania all the way to California. You know, I lived in a one bedroom with like eight different dudes, you know, didn't have no money working, trying to go to school, struggled in school, you know, and I was like, man, I got to go somewhere else. I got to get out of here, get out of this situation. So I went to the junior college down the road and I was kind of living out the locker room. So that was like a big story on ESPN and stuff. So yeah, I, I was I was living out of the locker room. But what I was doing there, um, you know, that, that team had been been a perennial loser. You know, they haven't been very good. And the coach was kind of like, man, you are a star player. We're going to build everything around you. And he was bringing all these schools to see me. And I was like, man, I love this coach. And he took a job. He left and took a job. And we didn't have a coach for like two months, three months. And in JUCO, California JUCO is a little different now. Like, there won't be no players there. Like, if there ain't no coach, no practice, like, there's no players. There's no nothing going on. So I started recruiting kids that weren't playing at the other junior college. I was looking at kids like, oh, you ain't even play last year. Come to our school. We'll, we'll get you right. And I was calling kids that I knew from out of state that, had been good players, but stopped playing. And I started recruiting the team and I started running kind of my own practices and stuff. I started running the practices and having dudes work out. And we just kind of started grinding that way. And that's kind of like my first taste of coaching and recruiting then, you know, and then we had a winning, a decent season, winning season and went off to, you know, get a scholarship at Tulsa and play for coach Malzahn and, and coach Graham. They gave me an opportunity to come there. Um, and we kind of set the world on fire. You know, coach Malzahn had just, was at Arkansas and was a high school coach. And we we were like the first offense in NCAA history to have a 5,000-yard passer, 3,000-yard receivers, and a 1,000-yard rusher in one season. Hey, hey, hey Coach, is is would you consider um, Coach Malzahn the, uh, 
the probably like the uh, the father of the RPO. No, I, I I consider him more of the the the, the tempo guy or the 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 spread wing T guy that you know ran the ball and the the wildcat guy. He you know brought that to college football. You know he did a lot of innovative things that brought to college football. I don't think coaches is big on the whole RPO deal as much as people might might think he is. I think he does a lot of read read triple stuff. You know where you get the ball out to a bubble guy stuff like that. But he wasn't huge on you know, the RPO stuff that, that wasn't really his, really his, his deal, but all the other stuff, as far as tempo, wildcat, wing T to spread up, you know, all that stuff. He, he really, you know, brought that to the forefront of college football. Okay. So now you, you play at Tulsa and then from there, where do you go from there? So it was crazy. So my junior year had an opportunity to leave. I had set the NCAA record for yards per catch. And I just didn't feel like I was big enough. And Tulsa was kind of the first team I was on. It felt like family, you know, like I had always, for me growing up the way I did, I, I went to a different high school and middle school every year. I went to a different school every year. I never went to the same school consecutively. So Tulsa was kind of the first place that felt like home. I mean, Oklahoma, you know, I went from Pennsylvania to California to Oklahoma and Oklahoma people just embrace you. Like everybody's like family, you know, it was, it was different for me in the Midwest. And so I stayed another year and I tore my ACL. To, to, I had another thousand yard season. I tore my ACL to conference championship game, the last play of the game. So I was projected like first, second, third round pick, first day pick. Then I tore my ACL right at the end of the season. So I didn't get drafted. I called the Dolphins myself because I went on a rookie visit there. And Coach Parcells and Sperano, uh, Mr. Ireland, they gave me a shot. So basically right before the season started there, I tore my ACL again. So Carl Durrell, who's now the head coach at Colorado, was my re receiver coach there. I tore my ACL right before camp. And then that first rookie year, I just was collecting checks and rehabbing my knee and was really lost. You know, when you put all your eggs in one basket, and you're trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. You know, so I was like, man. So my boy told me to get into coaching when I was out in California rehabbing my knee. He's like, you should get into coaching. So that next year, I, I met a coach, Coach Zuber. He was from Pennsylvania as well. And he was like, man, I've been out here. Da, da, da. These kids love football. You know, the school was kind of rough. There was 4,000 kids. They were from Oakland, San Francisco, Richmond, uh, Hayward, a lot of rough, a lot of rough places in the Bay Area. And so what coaching forced me to do, like the first day that I got out on that field, I knew that this is what I was going to do the rest of my life. I kind of found my purpose. So when I went out there, it was a lot of kids like looking at me like I was somebody like, man, you coach me to do this. Da, da, da. You played, you're, you're in the NFL. Cause I was still uh, basically under contract in the NFL. So I was like, you know, teach me to this, teach me to that. And I was like, man, these dudes are looking at me like I'm something I'm sitting there depressed and sad every day. Like man, I can't play. And these dudes were like, just all about everything football. And it was like, man, I remember being that young hungry kid. If a dude who even played college football came and talked to us, you know, it was like, man, this dude is the one, you know? And, and that kind of just changed the trajectory of my life. You know, I started I started coaching. He told me to, you know, use some of that Tulsa offense that we ran. He was a pistol guy, you know, Nevada, a Nevada pistol type offense, you know. So we, we were doing some of that with the Tulsa stuff. And he let me call plays. And I worked with the quarterbacks and receivers. I had guys living with me. You know, I had a whole bunch of money, you know, young, making 20, 30 grand a week, you know, with 21. I was just – blowing money left and right. And, and them kids, you know, really grounded me and got me right. Got me, got my life cleaned up, got me focused on what I really wanted to do. So my family was like, you need to try football one more time. You know, you can't give up. So I went to, I went to Canada because I was waiting for the, uh, waiting for a contract, you know, cause that was the year of the lockout. So the year of the lockout was when I was trying to get back into the league after the Dolphins released me that spring. So I was trying to get back into the league I went to Canada. I tore my ACL the first day of practice. Wow. And as I'm in the doctor's office going to, you know, get the uh, what, what my knee schedule is going to be like, the Cowboys call me and say, you got to work out next Tuesday. Mm. Got like, yeah. to be more careful. Yeah. And I said, man, this is crazy. But, you know, what was crazy about all these things is, you know, like as a football player, you want to know, like, did I give it my all? Was I a good player? You know how? How you rest your head at night? 
Right. You know, anytime I run into anybody who played with me or coached me, they always say like you had it, you were the one, you know, if you want to hurt your knee, you know, you, you, you had what it took. So that's kind of how I rest my rest my head with it. I knew that I did everything possible. I was the hard one of the hardest workers, always, you know, loved the game and did everything, was a great teammate. So, you know, I, I put that to bed. I put being a football player to bed, you know, and I came back to California uh, where, my, where my kids are at. And, and I just started coaching and I just dove into it full speed. I mean, at 25, I became a high school head coach um, at St. Patrick, St. Vincent. I took over the school that nobody wanted. I mean, they were like begging people to take the job. Mm -hmm. Nobody would take it because they had a hazing scandal the year before. And they only had my first meeting as a high school head coach. I had seven players in the meeting. The principal was kind of like, if you can make a team, great. If you can't, we'll just cancel the program. <clears throat> so we went from seven kids to a, to 45, a JV and a varsity team had a good staff with me and we went to the playoffs, lost in the first round. And, and it was just like that, you know, from yeah. starting off with seven people in your first meeting, you know, I'm like, we, we're not even going to have a team, you know what I'm saying? So uh, we did that. And then Pennsylvania, you know, uh, got a big opportunity there to be the youngest quad A head coach. I was 26 quad A is like the big division in mm -hmm. Pennsylvania, another school that never had a winning season. 0 and 10 the year before coach got fired in the middle of the season and uh you know got the opportunity to go there and you know that was really when i knew like i could really coach you know i was kind of just putting it together a little bit here and there you know when you first start out you're just trying to all the stuff that the good coaches taught me you know like i was blessed man i had mike norvell was my receiver coach now who's the head coach of florida state you know i had gus i had todd graham i had a lot of great coaches around me mm -hmm that coached me. So I, I had a lot of good things to give the kids that they gave to me, you know, but then I was like, all right, you know, as far as like, I'm going to really do this and do this my own way, do my own thing. And that's when I, when I went to Pennsylvania, that's when I really went wholesale and figured out that I could really, you know, coach, coach this game and, and, and take care of kids. So kind of from there, uh, we, we, uh, you know, there's a lot of great things that happen in our community. They never had kids that weren't academically ineligible. You know, anytime you take over a bad program, you got kids that are academically ineligible. They had drug problems within the school. They had a lot of things going on. And we got kids, we got the team from 40 players to 120, right? They had to buy more helmets. They didn't even have enough helmets, jerseys. I mean, we made, we, we ran that bill all the way up as far as, you know, the, the support that we got. We raised a million dollars and got them to get a new field. Uh, new stadium. We did all that within a year. We did all that in a year. We went to the, we won the conference championship. Uh, the first one in season and 20 something years at the school players from that team went to college. I just saw one the other day. He's out here in Hawaii. He's a Marine Sergeant making six figures living good. And he was like, coach, I love you, man. Thank you for you for the lessons you taught me. So, you know, I know I did a lot of good things in that community. I know they wanted me to stay there longer uh, than I did. Got an opportunity to go to college with, with Coach Graham at Arizona State in Norvell. And ultimately, <clears throat> when you make it to the highest level as a player, people don't really understand, like, your thought process as a competitor. You know, the competitor in you wants to go to the, to the highest level and do things at that, the highest level that you can do them, you know. And sometimes, you know, the first few years of college, I was thinking, like, man, I should have stayed a high school head coach. I really, you know what I'm saying? I went from, like, coach of the year, team of the year, doing great things, kids living with me, you know, kind of setting your own schedule to, hey, what's that idea you got? Oh, go get my coffee first, you know. <laughs> you know, it's just kind of, you know, kind of real, real humbling, you know, when you go back down, you know, especially you do it at a later age. So went back down, did that, learned a lot of good things. I was with a lot of good people, Dale Alexander, uh, who's at Notre Dame, you know, uh, Chip Long, who's at Tulane, Mike was the OC there. Coach Graham learned a lot of different things and and kind of how I got on with Coach London, you know, uh, was his son was with me with the Dolphins, Brandon. And so when I was a high school head coach in Pennsylvania, University of Virginia was about an hour and a half away. So I just I sent Brandon a message like, yo, man, I would really love to just speak to your pops. You know, like I want to get my team into the seven on seven he got. But we weren't very good. They were still coming off of being 0 and 10 and not a very good team. You know, so I was like. I don't even think there's like the math, uh, you know, like there's like Gonzaga, like real, real teams in this seven on seven. I'm like, we can't play with these, you know, like we're not going to get in here with these guys. I know he wants like guys that he can recruit, you know, and he let me get into the camp and we actually did really well in the camp and we're, 
you know, doing our offense and, and I, and I, so like when I did seven on seven, when I was a high school coach, I did it like our same offense. Like I wasn't like creating seven on seven plays or nothing like that. We were doing what we were going to do in an actual game setting. So uh, we were going up tempo and snapping it quick and doing all our stuff. And he was like, man, I, one day, man, I'm gonna hire you, man. You out here killing it. You know, like he was like, I like you. You're a good young brother. You know what you're doing. You, you're organized, you're detailed. The kids respect you. You know, and mind you, I was the first black teacher to ever work in the school. Like I, there was no, there was no black leadership there. You know, it was, it was small town USA, you know, uh, Pennsylvania, like out in the country. Like I'm from Pittsburgh, you know, that, yeah. that's like the city, Pittsburgh, Philly, Harrisburg, those are the cities, you know, but this, where I was at was like, you know, there, there wasn't, there wasn't many of us, you know, as far as black leadership. So, um, you know, he was like, man, you're doing a great job with these kids and I'm gonna give you an opportunity, you know, just stay in contact with me, stay in contact with me. So throughout the years, I would just stay in contact with them. So when I left Arizona State, I went to a division two school, Oklahoma Baptist coach to running backs. Um, and then from there, coach London got the Howard job and he was like, you ready to run that offense that you was running in high school? And I was like, coach, I got you. Just tell me where I need to be. I didn't ask him about nothing. Just because I knew the quality of man that Mike London was. It was kind of like, you know, when your college coach calls you, Norvell, Gus, Todd, when they call me, you know, it's like, boom, I'm there. You know, it ain't no, you don't have to really think about it, you know. And for Coach London, it was the same way he called me, boom. And so I tell young coaches this story all the time. I, I, I want to make sure people understand the story. So I went from a high school head coach, making decent money, being able to, you know, support my family and live okay, you know. Uh, and then I went to be, you know, GA or quality control, making 10 grand. I went to Oklahoma Baptist. I think I made like six or seven grand. And then boom, you know, I get a six figure contract with Coach London, you know, and, and people don't, you know, that's the type of faith, you know, people talk about faith and Jeremiah 29, 11, uh, but it's different when you actually walk it out, when you live it. You know, I went to California with, with no money, $200 and junior college was homeless, lived in a locker room. And then boom, I made it to the NFL, you know, got a division one scholarship and made it to the NFL. So, you know, you really got to walk that faith out, right? Faith has legs, you know, you got to put some legs to it. So mm -hmm. that's kind of like my story. And, you know, Coach London, obviously, we he let me do my thing. I mean, Coach London is goal, you know, as a person, he he said, do that, do your thing, man, and, and do it all the way. You know, there was no – Coach London is still my biggest mentor to this day. I call him we, – we probably talked every every couple of days here. You know, we, we talk all the time. You know, I love Coach London and his family. You know, obviously they they put me on the big stage in college football, give me an opportunity to to run my own deal. And, you know, and now I'm back here at Hawaii with Coach Graham and, and Coach Graham, the same thing. I mean, he gave me an FBS opportunity as a player and he gave me one as a coach, you know, to get into coaching. So there's nothing but love there for both of those guys that they give me the opportunity to, to do it. Can we go back a second? So when you said you was in school, and you had tore up your ankle and you was going through the process of going to the NFL and you tore up your uh tore up your ACL again. You said you felt real depressed, right? I noticed, I noticed that a lot of cats that's going through the process, uh, the ones that don't make it, they always because my son, he only played one year too, and he went through that period of I don't say depression, but he wasn't his best version of himself. So yeah. and so he was like let down the boy had an engineering degree but he was working at a moving company working 12 hours a day so why why do you think that happens man it's just you know like you put all those hours in and your and your makeup your dna it's like if you put me anywhere with a football on some people like i'm always get something going with, with, with football, you know what i mean like that's just who you are you know like people say that's not who you are you're you're somebody but Really, if you've been doing it, I started football at five years old, six years old. So it's like if you do that every day, you're, that's all you think about. That's all you do. And like you said, my cousin was like, you got a degree for what you worried about. You know, like you got a degree from the University of Tulsa. What you worried about? You know, and it was like the same thing. You're, you know, your son is thinking like, man, I'm a football player, you know, and especially if you had some success with it. Like if you if you played and played at an elite level, high level and you're like, man, no, that's that's what I am. Like, I, you know, and. I think once you just find that purpose and that calling, you know, like your passion will lead you to your purpose. You know, you can impact the game in a different way. I tell people all the time, like, 
you know, just because you can't impact it as a player, you can still impact the game in other ways. And now it's it's a lot different, you know, and it's kind of like Inky Wright, don't let an injury injure your whole life. You know, there's a lot of life after football, and there's a lot of ways that you can still make an impact and have a positive influence on people with the game that you love. You know, even if you don't stay in the game as far as, like, coaching, you know, there's guys that I know that are are doing really well. Like my cousin, he does really well. Uh at his at his job at his at his nine to five job but he also trains kids on the side you know mentors he does little things on the side to keep them close to the game you know and that's really what it is you know you just kind of figure out like this is who i've been you know like i've lifted all these weights i ran all these sprints i've scored these touchdowns you know i'm like this is this is me right here and then you figure out like yeah this is a part of me but this is not all of me it's like a lot of you guys don't realize that there's a lot of lanes after playing, you know, like you, you can coach, you can train, you can be a scout, you can try to go into the front office, you can do player evals. Like it's a, it's a lot of, it's a lot of different ways that you can stay involved in the game um, outside of playing. No doubt. So mm-hmm. now let's get into the fun part. Okay. Yeah. The go, go offense. Yeah. In one word, one word, coach. Describe the go go offense. Exception. I love that one. I love- <laughs> <laughs> talk that thing, baby. Talk, that thing. talk your hey, talk. You are the creator, owner, originator of the go go offense, right? What is the concept behind this, and why you think it's so effective? Um, the biggest thing that I tell people all the time is what's the offense that you, that you hate to see every, every, if you're a high school coach or a college coach, you hate to see the triple option. Yeah. Right. And that's what this offense gives you the ability to do. It gives you the ability to turn every run play that you've ever thought of in football into a triple option run. And so that, that's the biggest thing, right? So that's the number one thing, a defensive coordinator, a defense, anybody that, coaches defense they want to stop the dive they want to stop the run nobody wants to get the ball ran all over them so it gives you the ability to have your receivers be electrifying down the field as far as just they're going to be one-on-one at all times you know they're going to have a lot of one-on-one opportunities to make plays down the field and have a lot of big plays and the run game and the up tempo and and all that type of stuff like it's it's kind of foolproof you know i've seen it work at so many schools now, you couldn't tell me with, with less talent versus better talent. You couldn't tell me that, you know, oh, your offense is this or that, or it's a gimmick. How long did it take you to, to, to work all the kinks out of it and get it to where it's a smooth machine? 2013, I was playing with my playing with it my first year as a head coach. I was playing with it. We had more receivers than we had running backs, though. So I was a lot of 10 personnel stuff. I was playing with it. I was tinkering with it. Actually, like, it's crazy. I had my kids doing it. Right. My kids would like to work out. And anytime we would work out, I would be messing with the two backs and how I would do the steps. So I was going through the steps myself, because if you look at football, I really didn't. What I did was I put an offense that was under center and truly just based off the veer and all that. I put it in. I put it in shotgun. I moved it back, put it in shotgun. And then I started adding all the run game menu to it. And then the pass game stuff to it. Right. And then I started motioning guys and shifting guys and doing different things where it where it made it a whole menu, right? So people say, well, I lined up two back side by side before. Yeah, but you just ran straight ahead. You, you know, you didn't you didn't have a whole offense with it. That is different. You know, we have 25 different formations where the backs line up side by side. Then we have shifts, we have motions, we have reverses, we have passes, drop back, quick game. You know, there's a whole bunch of different things that you have with it, right? You're creating an entire offense, right? So um, that's when I, when I got to 2014, that's when I knew when I got when I got a chance to call it in college one day that the offense will work in college. So I took the worst team in the state of Pennsylvania, the worst offense. Right. And we ended up averaging 500 yards a game and scoring close to 40 a game. Right. With no no recruiting, no, you know, like people say, like, you know, it was the same guys that they had on the team last year. Only thing that changed was the way that they trained. The, the leadership that they had in the offense. That's the three things that changed, right? right? And so that was that was the offense that we ran. And so when I got to college, you know, that's what Coach London said, run that same offense that you ran in, ran in high school. So 2014 was where I really got it foolproof. So 2010, when I called plays, when I was on injury reserve with the Dolphins, <clears throat> I was calling Coach 
Coach Malzahn and Coach Zuber's offense, right? But I didn't know the reasons why, right? I, I hate calling the offense or calling the play where I don't know why I'm calling the play. I'm just calling it because that's what we ran when we got to the 25-yard line on the left hash. We always ran this play and it always worked. Or third and six, this is what we always ran when it was third and six. You know, that's why I was calling the plays. And so I started when I really when I got hurt in Canada and I was up in I was in I actually was in ICU for a little bit because I had lost a lot of blood. And then I was in the hospital for a while. I was in I was in my notebook. Right. You know, people say I'm, I'm in my bag. I was in my notebook and I'm writing. I'm like, man, I'm gonna come up with my own situation. I'm gonna come up with my own stuff. So 2012, um, I was at Harker Academy. It was a private school. It has seven billionaires on the team. I mean, we kids that ain't never played football, Asian Indian kids, uh, didn't have a familiar uh, background with football. You know, it was the first year I had to actually teach them how to put the pads in their pants. You know, us as coaches, we had to teach them how to put the pads in their pants. That's just very foreign to me being from Pennsylvania. I thought you just were born and you knew how to do football, you know, like you just, just kind of knew. And so, you know, when I was with those kids, I started messing with it. Right. When I was a JV head coach, I just started messing with it, playing with it. And it's, it was working. I was like, oh, OK, this is working. Like, you know, whatever the kids believe in, you know, and they and they believe in their leadership and they believe in what you practice and it works in practice. It'll work in the game. I'm like, OK, this is working. 2013, we were number two in California behind De La Salle in offense, you know, and I was doing just a little bit of it. It was like 25 percent. So I was like, when I get to Pennsylvania, we going we going on full go with it wholesale. And that's the numbers took off. And then when I got to college, we were top 25 both years at Howard. Um, William and Mary, the only thing we were missing was the passing game. We didn't have an elite passing game. We didn't have those receivers on the edge. I had two guys that had never played the receiver position. They were quarterbacks that I moved to receiver because they were athletes. And so they were they were decent at the position. They did a good job. Our run game, though, went from last in the country. OK, so every offense that I've taken over as a coach, right? St. Patrick, St. Vincent was last. Uh, Waynesboro was last in the state of Pennsylvania. Howard was a hundred and something close to last. And William and Mary was last in FCS and offense. Right. And so I stand here today, you know, people are like, oh, well, you, you, you know, you think this and that, you know, whatever. And it's really like you give somebody nothing and they turn it into something you got to respect that if you really know the game and respect the game you got to understand that i wasn't doing this at an established program i was doing this at all places where they didn't have the pieces to the puzzle and we were still able to go out there and there's not a team that we didn't play that wasn't worried about what we were doing offensively and, and thought we had a chance to win the game or what we did so so the go-go offense right and this because reed love the wing t right so the wing T, you really don't have to have superstar players. You just have to execute the concept, right? It is the go-go offense the same way where you don't have to have superstar players. You just got to execute the concept. Is that yeah? How that's what that's what it does for you. It's the it's the triple the triple option the triple element option to all the runs, right? So even if we're running outside wide zone, right or inside zone there's another element to it if the line blocks nobody the quarterback can pull the ball and make you right right there's always somebody who can make the play right even if things go wrong because i was looking at it like i'm not going to these program that got all the linemen and, and got all these players yet so i got to find something that nobody cares that you don't got good enough players yet they still want to see you win and put up points and score and that was my thought process i'm like i still got to score and win and give my guys a chance to win the game. I can't tell them that they ain't good enough. I got to find something that, that says, all right, we're good enough and we can at least go out there with confidence and, and some swagger that we can put up some points and we can have an opportunity to win this game. So that's kind of what it does. It gives you that element of always having a chance on each play. There's not a lot of negative plays. There's not a lot of plays where there's not an option, you know, but the hardest thing it is, it's, it's hard on the quarterback. It's really hard on the quarterback because he has to make that, decisive decision all the time kind of like the triple option game is it's really hard on the quarterback of making that right read all the time so coach you you're mastering this offense you perfecting it but what kind of blew it up nationally for you is you the oc at howard you guys are 45 point underdogs against unlv and you knock them off and, and that was a major game um kind of 
explain that, the feeling of that. You totally dominated those guys offensively that day. And that's kind of what put the go-go offense in the national conference. Yeah, it was big. Just It was big from the standpoint of, like, if you just look at the dynamic of what we had when we got to Howard, I mean, we didn't have enough linemen to practice against each other. You know what I'm saying? When we got there in the spring, you know, we didn't even have a strength coach for most of the time that we were there before we played unit. Like we didn't get a strength coach until July. You know, we had limited spring practices because of, because of saying, you know, like we had a lot of things against us. The deck was, the deck was stacked against us. But the one thing that we had, you know, like Coach London started it off with Mission mission Possible. That was our kind of our slogan for the year. Um, we had a young quarterback, Kalen Newton, that was there that came in. And, he, and I kind of told him, like, man, this is our Alabama. This is our Auburn, like, you know, because his brother Cam and all his success. Yeah. And I was like, man, we got to make this our, our, our Auburn, our Alabama. Like, we got to make this, like, we got to be larger than life. We got to dream big. But he was not necessarily ready ready for leadership yet. So we had some older cast that had been there and been used to losing. And and one of the great things that Coach London did, we had some kids that, you know, probably shouldn't have been there for some of their conduct that they had in the past. And we gave them a second chance, you know, and we just told them, like, we just brought them down every day and we just poured into them. We just taught them how to really be real leaders and pour into them and just one year, trap for one year, just do it right, have faith, dream big, like we're going to do something big. And those dudes were leaders, right? You know, everybody has a, a chance to lead people positively or negatively. And they just switched from being negative to being positive, right? And to see the look on those kids' faces and that celebration, it was just like, you know what I mean? Because those were kids that were dejected, beat up. They, they didn't think that they had a chance in football to be really great at football. You know, they were just at Howard to get the degree and the girls and everything that comes with the HBCUs as far as, you know, at Howard, you know, being in DC, big time city, a lot of things, a lot of things aside from football that they could get into and they were into, you know, so to see that game play out, not only, you know, like I told you, like I, I when I saw the Waynesboro team, coach, the Waynesboro team, what we did there, I knew that it would work in, in college football. Like I had no, I had no doubt about that. No doubt about it. But when we, when we did it with a 225 pound right tackle, a freshman quarterback, uh, you know, a, a kid, everybody on the line except for one kid had never started before. You know, like when you do it with those guys and you haven't really practiced and, and you know, hit every day and did all that, you know, and you're able to go beat somebody, it's like, man, we're really like, like, like God is good. You know what I'm saying? It was really just, it was really that experience. Like, man, you know what? You just believe you have faith, like great things going to happen to you. And, and that was a big, that was a big moment. It was a big opportunity. You know, obviously we we didn't even you know, the great thing about Coach London is we, we went we went to Vegas two days before the game. We stayed in, I think, the MGM and he let the players, you know, <clears throat> enjoy Vegas. And I'm right. I'm like nervous. I'm like, coach, we need to have these dudes in the hotel. We need to be doing walkthroughs. We need to, you know, keep going over it, keep going over it. And he's like, no, let them enjoy the time. Da, da, da. It's going to be all right. We're going to win. And we went out there and got it done. So wow. is is anybody copying? The concept or the offense now that it's taken off? Yeah, you've seen it all over. Uh, a guy, Steven, and, and my guy, Emery Hunt, and a guy named Dan Casey, they've kind of put the stuff out there now for a few years. And uh, I've seen, you know, NFL teams, the Chicago Bears, Cardinals, uh, different teams lining up with them two back side by side and running plays that we run and uh, in college and the NFL every uh, tons of high school coaches i mean it, it's it's a it's a big deal now i mean it's there's not a day that goes by where i don't get can you send me something coach can we go over it you know there's not a day that right. i don't have that so coach what a lot of people we talk to a lot of young coaches a lot you know whether it's mentoring giving advice and guide you said some early on that you were a ga an analyst and you also coached for a little bit of money at the D2 level. A lot of guys, a, a lot of young black coaches, okay, that we talk to that want opportunities to coach in the college level, some of them are unwilling to do a GA or an analyst. You know, they feel like they should be able to go straight, you know, to the big time. Kind of kind of walk them through that and, and, and get them some guidance in terms of what some of the things that they can do to break into the profession at the college level 
and what are some of the opportunities they have to be willing to take if they want an opportunity to coach at that level? It's been kind of, you know, like since I was in high school, people would tell me I was lucky. You know what I'm saying? Like you're lucky or, you know, you got a great smile or, you know, stuff like that. Like you just, and the difference I think is when I learned as a kid and I learned from my mom, I mean, there was times we had eviction notices on our door kicked out, you know, and I still go to school. I still do what I needed to do. And I'm just willing to go places that other people aren't willing to go. And I think that you have to be willing to, to put yourself out on a limb. I mean, if you really, believe that you're a dude, you know what I'm saying? You look in that mirror and you believe like, man, I'm really, I really can do this stuff. You know, you're, you're willing to take those jumps and risks because you know, at the end of the day, a baller's going to ball. You're going you're gonna to find a way to get to that, to that spot that you want to be in. And so the, the first thing is comes just your mental makeup or you have the mental toughness and wherewithal to go through the things that getting the coffee and, you know, being a recruiter only. And, you know, the things that you have to do to get to where you want to be. I mean, you have to do a lot to, to get through that. You know, I don't have any grandfathers or dads or trust funds that, that were coaches. And, you know, I, I didn't have that, you know, so, and a lot of us that look like us don't, don't have that. Right. We got to find a way to fight through the minutia, like coach uh, Tomlin says, and, and get yourself there to where you want to be. So, you know, a lot of times I tell guys like take that entry level job. You know, I told a, I told two young kids at Howard to do that. Right. They got done playing right. Two of my players, after that good season, I'm like, everybody loves our offense, right? You guys know the offense. Take it and run with it, right? Take it and run with it. Like the same, that's what I did. You know, everybody knew that I played for Coach Malzahn, and I knew his offense. So what I did, that's how I, that's how I maneuvered and to get into lanes and to get get my get myself a shot, you know, and that's what they did. Now one's the running back coach for Howard full time, you know, making good money, and the other one's a high school head coach down in Florida. You know, so you just got to understand, like, you have to take whatever you have, right, that connects you with people, that little bit of, I always talk about the six degrees of separation, that can get you in somewhere. You know, like, all you got to do is get in the building. If you believe you're a dude, if I get in the building, if I, if I get in the building, if I just got an opportunity to get in the building, I know I'm a, I know I'm a rise, right? The cream always rises to the top. You, if I can just get in the building somewhere. So the key is I go back through – What's my contact list? How many people do I know? Where am I from? What players do I know? Because players can get you in too. There's a lot of coaches that got in because of their players. Um, there's a lot of things that can get you in there. But then you can't say, well, I'll only do it if this is this or if this is that. That, That's 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 God's control. You, you don't have control over that. You have control of getting in there and trying to figure out like, okay, how do I get in here? Once you get that opportunity, you got to understand like, I know who I am when I look in the mirror and I know that I can get this done. This, this little job that they gave me, right? If it was sweeping the floors, I'm going to be the best dude that sweeps in the floors. Then I'm going to move up. Then I'm going to move up. Then I'm going to move up. I'm going to just keep moving up. And it's the same thing that you would have to do if you went to corporate America. You know, if you went anywhere, any entry level job, you got to prove yourself and get in there. You know, I think the problem with us is we don't have slush funds. We don't have trust funds. We don't have, uh, backup money, you know, or somebody who can, you know, supplement the bill for us. You know, we can't GA for five years. We can't, you know, we can't do that because we've put ourselves in situations where we're already, you know, we're already financially unstable. We're, we've, we've kind of been given that, that, that hand, you know what I'm saying? So for me, it's just like, you know, uh, coach Franklin said it one time when I was at the coaches convention, he said, you just got to be broke as long as you can. And, you know, try to limit the responsibilities that you have. You know, if you want to get into coaching, you know, and you got three or four kids, it's probably going to be hard for you because you don't have the money to support your, your, your family, right? Unless your wife has a good job or, you know, something like that. So you just got to look at your situation, but then ultimately you got to believe who you are and what you can do and, and your work ethic, the same work ethic that you had. And in, in, as a player, I tell people to keep that same work ethic as a, you know, you got those same skills and attributes they don't leave you because you do a different job. I mean, I still got the same skills and attributes. If I was able to get a scholarship out of living out of a locker room, I know I can become a college head football coach. I mean, I know that, you know what I'm saying? You got those same, same attributes. I asked you, I asked you this off camera before we started, right? About, you know, the black coaches getting this opportunity as the white coaches. And you said no. So when you think, do you think that's by design 
or do you think that's out of fear? Um, I think there's a there's a few factors that play into it. Um, I think a lot of the factors are um, like you're looking at me right here and you're saying you're talking about the go-go offense and different things like that. You know, you, you, what do you have that brings value? You know, if you're just uh, copying somebody else or you're just a recruiter, you know, you don't have something that really brings extra value to you to the table. Why should I give you an opportunity as somebody who's foreign to me? than somebody who looks like me and it's my friend or my nephew or my son or my grand, you know, like, because you don't, you don't bring any value. You see some coaches that are getting opportunities. Josh Gaddis, he, he was, he was innovative with the RPOs with Loxley. Loxley did the, the, the RPOs. He got a head coach and, you know, like they had something that made them that, that had value that brought something different to the table and they were able to get into those positions of, of leadership roles. And I think anytime you see, the black coaches that rise to the top, like, you know, Coach London was big with the three, four defense, four eyes and, you know, um, his leadership. He was a cop, the type of man that he was, the person that he was, you know, that gave him an opportunity to be the head coach at Virginia, right. you know, and the head coach at what, you know, like you have to have some value that you bring to you. If you're just in there and you're just getting the money, you know, because a lot of dudes do, they just get the money. You know, when you're making four or 500,000, you know, why do I want to go learn and be a scheme guy? Why do I want to? You know, like I'm, I'm good. I'm bringing the players in. I'm, I'm getting my money. I'm good. There's coaches that are like that, you know, and then there's coaches that just haven't got the opportunity yet. And, you know, winners keep going, you know, and you're going to find a way eventually to, to, to somebody's going to give you that shot. You know, not everybody sees it in the, the old school way of, you know, one here and one on that side of the ball. Some guys really, you know, just don't know you yet. You got to get yourself in front of people. Like what I've been doing, you know, the last two years is, completely foreign to me you know people think because i have a big social media presence right the social media presence really just came from people like cool football plays it didn't come from anything other than that i mean uh you know but now i've been doing these network and taking guys to lunch and you know going to do different things you know talking to ad's and things like that that's way out of my comfort zone i'm i'm really just a, a football i'm a ball guy like i just want to talk football with you and, and help kids. I really don't want to. So, so is your aspirations to be a head coach one day? Yes. Yes, sir. Hey, you know what? I like you. Yeah. You're the first person that ever came on and told the truth. <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm not lying. Ask Reed. Everybody else, come on. You be like, hey, your aspirations to be a head coach? Oh, no, no, I'm happy. Hey, I like you, man. Tell the truth. Shane and Devin. Trans like Transparency you. builds trust, baby. I, I just... I, I mean, it's what it is. If you cut me open, I want to be a head coach. I don't even like people say you're an offensive guy. I'm like, no, I'm a head coach. In my mind, I'm like, I just want to be a head coach. You know? So do, like, do, do you think, do you think, because I was telling Reed this, right? The majority of the faces of college football programs are white, right? But the assistant coaches be black a lot, right? Yeah. So do you think it's better to be an assistant coach for 10, 15 years and you know you can help guys because you're going to have stability at that position as a position coach? Because if you're a black guy and you move into a head coach, if you don't win within three years, you out of there. So do you think it's better to be a position coach or a head coach as a black as a black man? Well, there's a lot of young, like we just talked about, there's a lot of young coaches and a lot of players that play for me and – all they talk to me about is stability. And I, what I, all I've talked to you guys about is faith. So for me, I'm not really looking for like, oh, this job is, I'm so stable and, you know, I got this cushy job and da da da. Cause I just believe that, you know, like God gonna work it out. I'm gonna be good, you know? So like for me, I'm going for, I'm going for it. You know what I mean? Our place I'm, is a wall. Go get it. Go yeah, get it. Yeah. You know, you know, I'm like, 50, get rich or die, you know, like I'm gonna I'm go, I'm gonna go for it, you know. If you can't do it, it can't be done. That's 50 songs. If I can't do it, then it can't be done, you know, because I just couldn't sleep at night if I didn't, you know, like I just couldn't. For me, that's just not my mental makeup. Like I couldn't just say, like, oh, I, I haven't tried, you know, I'm gonna try every op avenue opportunity that, that can get me there. I'm gonna I'm I'm go for it, you know, I'm that's just the type of guy that I am. You know, but for some people, stability is important to them. They don't want to switch jobs. They want to make sure their kid is in the same school, you know, all yeah. those things, you know. And for me, I mean, if if they say travel is your number one, that's the that's the way you can be the wealthiest person in the world is by travel and experience. 
then then I'm then I've went from Pennsylvania to Hawaii. You know, so you know what I mean. I mean, for me, I'm not thinking be stable and just stay a position coach and just be happy with you know your room because you know nothing's better than when I was a high school head coach and can and changing an entire community. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Nothing's better than when those people tell me you changed this community and you changed the community down there and the community down there by by your leadership. To me, that's impact and influence at a, at a higher level. You know, if you've been Coach Reed, you know, as a head coach, it's it's different. You know, for some guys, they've only been position coaches. I've actually tasted what it's like to be a head coach and how many people you can help. I mean, I played point guard my whole life growing up, so I'm all about assisting and helping people. You know, because that's that's your job. You know, so that's what a head coach is. You just help people all day. I mean, all day long, you're just trying to put people in position to score. Being being a head coach definitely puts you in position to impact lives on a lot of levels, you know, and it's way deeper than the X's and O's. You get the opportunity to change lives for your coaches, for your players, for the administration, for the people in the community. You can provide opportunities for some of your parents and get them to see things in a different perspective. And so you really can change um, generational curses for families. Um, so it was crazy, that. Coach. Like when I was a when I was a high school head coach, I had two coaches that came and lived with me. One was my cousin, another one was a guy named Will from Florida. They were struggling financially, trying to figure out what they were going to do in life. They both came and stayed with me. They met they met a couple of boosters, became friends with them, started hanging out with them, got six figure jobs, and, and took care of that. Got their own situation, got got set up, you know. And that that's the one thing as a head coach, like for that them, you can man. do. That situation for them is a life changer. Also, yeah. also, Coach, let's touch on this. We talked about this a, a couple weeks ago. How important is it, especially if you're a high school coach? And now I'm talking to, to the young African-American high school coaches, right? Um, most of us, when we get high school jobs, especially where we're from, the first guys you go to hire are your old teammates, your friends, all right, maybe some of your family members. How important is it to hold them accountable that they do a good job and understanding that in this business, if you want to be really good and they don't do a good job, you have to have the strength to move on from them in a lot of situations. How like how how important is it for high school coaches to hold their staff accountable the same way that they're doing at the upper levels if you have aspirations of winning and being good? This is where we connect the coach. You know, my, my, I fired my own cousin before yeah. when I was a high school head coach. You know, and we we're a month apart. We slept in the crib together. I mean, we, we're we're still stick as thieves, close best. You know everything. But if you're not going to do right and not going to hold the standards of the program, you got to hold everybody to that. And the number one thing is when 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 you're a black coach and you get an opportunity. I mean, any coach really. I mean, black or white don't really matter. You got to win. You know, and you got to hire people that can help you win. And and, and the number one thing is you got to hire people that that love kids, you know, and what I learned the first time was different when I was a head coach. The first time as a high school coach, I just hired a whole bunch of dudes that were big time coaches. Then I was coaching the offense, the defense, the special teams, because they didn't show up for practice. They, they weren't accountable. They weren't, they didn't do the right thing for the job. Yeah. You know, so what I did the next time when I went to Pennsylvania, I just got a whole bunch of foot soldiers. I got dudes that love the game, love kids. And if I told them to, to, to shovel poop in the parking lot, they do it with a smile on their face, you know, and and that's what I that's what I did the second time because I can teach you the X's and O's, I can teach you the scheme, but I can't teach you the, you know, the your your work ethic, your your punctuality, being on time, you know, your accountability to the kids. When you sign up for that, no matter what the pay is, if I can give you a fifty thousand dollar job or a twelve hundred dollar stipend, I mean, you got to still have the same commitment to the kids because that's what you signed up for. You know, I always tell. It's a one year contract for all coaches, but whatever that one year is, you, you're all in on making them impact for them kids and doing what we need to do to get done for this program. So, you know, that's the biggest thing is you got to really like as a, if you're just a if you're just a coach. Right. Like, for example, when I when I was an offense coordinator, my first year uh, with my first year coaching, I turned down going to a workout with the Buffalo Bills because it was the playoffs and I was and I was helping as the offensive coordinator and the quarterback and receiver coach were in the playoffs. I turned down a workout to go work out with the bills. Cause I was like, I told these kids that I'm gonna be here for them throughout the year. You know, I can't, I can't leave and not, you know what I'm saying? Now, if it was the off season, I'm on the flight, I'm going to do what I need to do. But during season, 
right? And and you 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 got to be you got to be a man of your word. I mean, your word is all you got. What you just said was impressive, right? <laughs> because we live in St. Louis and in, in Missouri, right? And a lot of coaches, a lot of coaches and trainers, they say it's all about the kids. I'm on here for the kids. But goddamn, every time it's that moment where you got to show us all about the kids, they show us about they saw. Yeah. And so I commend you on that because that show your character, man. Like uh, high school coaches in St. Louis, think all I got to do is coach three years, win the state championship, and I'm going to be on Alabama coaching staff in year four. Yeah. And it is, that's that's not the truth. It, it don't work like that at all. So, like, for you to be like, yo, because you was going to get paid. Like, you go to that workout, you get the contract, you get your money triple. You live in La Vida Loca. So for you to be like, you know what? No, nah, I'm with these kids, man. I gave them my word, bro. I salute you for that. That's real, man. I, I like I like when Reed bring on real cats. We didn't have some cats on here. And I was like, you know what, fat man? This dude probably lying. <laughs> I ain't going to say a word. But, man, I think the man, he doing it for the camera. the truth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, like, you seem like a cat with a good spirit. Uh, I was reading your bio, and I was, I what well, the the thing that I took away from your reading your bio, um, you a first guy, like you a first competitor. Every time in your bio, when you had a chance to quit and you could have been justified for quitting, you found another way to do it. Yeah. Who the fuck sleep in the locker room? You was my hero. Yeah. You that. was my hero for just like. When you read your bio, every time they put something in front of you and you be like, you know what? This hurdle too high to hop over. I can't do it. I'm going to quit. I'm going to go do something else. You said hopping over. And I'm going to go up under. Didn't yeah. nobody say it was illegal to go up under the hurdle. I just went yeah. up under. Yeah. So, bro, I'm digging you, man. I'm digging. Yeah. I like that. I like that, especially from young coaches. Like, that's what be making me happy when they put a young guy like yourself in a position to flourish. And you not only do you flourish, but you don't let it change who you are. Yeah. So I, I that. that's I, that's what I so it, it kind of like that's what I started hiring coaches as and how I help coaches. It's like tell me your story first. Don't give me no X's and O's and how many players you got. And da, da, da. It's like just tell me your story first because then I can tell like the cloth of the person and what they about. You know because all that all that other stuff is is fleeting. If you don't got good players, are you just become a terrible? Time a terrible person, terrible coach. If you don't, if the scheme don't work out, what you gonna do? You gotta learn another scheme, you know. Like, and I think that's the biggest thing is just finding good people to be around and you know, people that got those those stories that come from nothing. That's what I respected about, you know, when Coach Malzon and Coach Graham and Coach Norvell recruit me, even though they didn't look like me, you know, they were opposite color or whatever, they had the stories of Coach Malzon coming from a trailer park starting out to you know talk about the from the outhouse to the penthouse you know like coach graham same thing coach norvell same thing just those stories are like all right you started from nothing you know i can respect that you know i can respect the guy who went went out there and got it yeah like you gonna be <laughs> fine so if you could have any job in college football if you could coach anywhere where would it be and why well i'd have to say i'd have to say pittsburgh because I'm, I'm from i'm from pittsburgh so you know, and okay. I just know that, that, that football is different there. You know, I, 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 and you know what? Now I'm going to put you on the spot. Yeah. You ready? Yeah. Here we go. I'm going to put you on the spot. Them boys down in Texas say Texas is the epicenter of, of high school football. They say that. Hey, and, and, I'm going to tell you what I'm going to tell you what Mr. Rooney told. What, I'm in what a Mr. Rooney chat said. with a lot of. So Mr. Rooney said, uh, he said, uh, you know, they asked, we want to make, we want to make the Pittsburgh Steelers America's team. You know, we want to, you know, they were trying to figure out who's going to be considered America's team. Right. And he said, we're the Pittsburgh Steelers. And that's how the Cowboys became America's team. Cause we said, we're the Pittsburgh Steelers, not America's team. Mm -hmm. So that's what I always tell people <laughs> from Texas who say Texas football is, you know, all this and all that. It's a, it's a, it's, it is good. I mean, it's a whole country out there. I mean, you can make Texas a whole, it's its own, you know. You think country. if you put the top five Pittsburgh teams out to Texas, y'all could win? Yes, sir. 
Out them five games, y'all win three, three, two, four, one, five. So think about our 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 state is very small, right? Very small state, very small state. We're at least in the top three, maybe top five for most NFL Hall of Famers. And we all play in the same conference. Like it ain't like you can't hide and you know, you're not like one school just dominate one league. I mean, back in the day when I played high school football in Pittsburgh, you would have to play Gronkowski, Revis. You know, you'd have to play all in that same conference of those guys you know you wouldn't there was no hiding you know you had to play yeah, you, had to face them. you had to stand in there yeah you had to play real dudes every week you know you weren't going against somebody who couldn't play you know like everybody you play cool as a mug Reed. cool as a mug man yeah because yeah. when i talk because my son go to tech to the university of texas and when you talk to people in texas they feel like texas is the birthplace of high school football and you can't tell them nothing different. And so talk to you, you know, like Pittsburgh do got some, you know, Dan Marino. I think Montana from there as well. Y'all got y'all got history. Y'all got history as a state producing uh players, but you can't tell people from Texas that yeah. they, they they are totally the, the head coach in the Super Bowl right now, uh Bruce Arians. He's a Pennsylvania guy. I mean, so there's a lot, of, there's a lot of there's a lot of his, history and culture of uh, uh, football in Pittsburgh. I think like even from, you know, like I remember my mom broke the TV when the Steelers lost to the Cowboys in the Super Bowl. I mean, it's even the women are – I mean, everybody's serious about football in Pittsburgh. It's just smaller. I mean, you know, you got states like California, Texas, Florida. They're, they're huge states. They're going to have a lot more players. But then there's the states like Louisiana, you know, that are smaller but still have that – you know what I mean? Have that punch to them, you know, and have them players. So, you know what I mean? And, and, and don't get me wrong. I think Texas football is – they do it. They do it just like college football. I mean, they do it. They do it all the way. You know what I mean? Well, no, what, I no say, what I will say about the state of Texas and, and, and on a high school level, I think they have mastered the art of developing college quality quarterbacks. I think yeah. I think the state of Texas, I think they do a great job of developing quarterbacks. I really do. There's no there, – there, that's the thing. They have – they have a real coaching staff because they can pay a, an entire coaching staff, right? They have they have real facilities because they have people that really believe in impacting and helping kids. I think they just have better support. And anytime there's better support, you know, as a if you've been a high school head coach and if you have a good administration, you can take that program as far as you want to take it, right? If they're really supporting you and behind you in a community that yeah, yeah, that really is, you know what I mean. And that's what Texas has, and they just have it in like every district, not just. You know, they, Texas, in, in Texas, they got seven-man tackle football leagues. And the fields, the field for the seven-man tackle team rival some of the best stadiums in St. Louis. I can't believe it. Like, when, yeah. you're, flying in, when you're flying into Texas, that's all you see is the, the big high school football fields. And you're like, what is that? Oh, yeah. that's the seven-on-seven team. The seven-on-seven? Yeah. Wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. So they yeah. definitely got the resources for it. So – what is your next goal? And like, do you think you can take if you, if given the opportunity? Do you think you can turn around? Like, let me let me just let's say the University of Illinois, the University of Illinois. It's not a good school. It's not a bad school. It's a, you know, it's a struggling school. Do you think if you was to get the job at Illinois, you could you could you could turn a program like that around? Yes, there's a big city in Illinois, Chicago. 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 There's a big city there. So you would have an opportunity to get city league players. You have to develop those players, right? Need different type of development. But I think anywhere where there's a big city, uh, where there's where there, where there's talent at, I mean, you can you can definitely take it to a next level. Now it's the league hard, yes. Right. And then what does success look like at those universities? It's kind of like when James Franklin took over Vanderbilt. And won what he won nine games, eight games, something like that at Vanderbilt. That's a lot of success. Reed Reed said this one day. He said that uh, at a school like Vanderbilt, at a school like Vanderbilt, the coach could win eight games and get a five-year contract extension, right? Eight games, get him a five-year contract extension. But if Nick Saban win eight games, they're talking about replacing him. So yeah. sometimes the 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 is is different. The reason I ask you that is because from talking to you, 
I mean, I ain't nobody in the decision making process, but I think you deserve a shot. Yeah. I think I think you deserve a shot at being a head coach from talking to you. Um, I don't see where you are BS the kids or the parents. Uh, you've been through the process, so I was just asking because I, I was like, "Yo, dude, probably deserve a shot." Because we was talking about Eric B. Enemy, right? And everybody saying he getting passed over, he getting passed over, he getting passed over, right? But I think he just looking for the right situation because the stakes are so high for him. Yeah. So he just can't take the first job that come on the table. He got to take a job where they're gonna be committed to him because he might not get another chance if he, if, if this don't work. So that's that's why I was asking you like. When when you looking at a team that's gonna offer you the head coaching position, do it matter what school it is or a certain criteria that they gotta meet? Because no, I think for like Coach B enemy, after meeting him and hearing him speak, I think that he's he can lead anywhere and he's in a position now where he can't fail. You know, he no matter what he does, he's made it to the NFL as a player, had a playing career in the NFL, he's been an offense coordinator and won a Super Bowl, you know might win another one here, you know, like if he goes to a team and they, and it's not, you know, he doesn't win the Super Bowl or he's not, you know, all, all world or all everything. He's still going to be an offense coordinator somewhere. You know, Like he's still, there, there's nowhere he can. He got value. Yeah. He got so much value that he can't fail. So for him, I'm like, man, I, I would take, if they gave me the text, you know, wherever I, I would take, I would take the Jets. Yeah. The jet, you know, whatever, Who, whoever's the worst team. He get the job at the Jets on Monday. He gonna be fired by that Sunday because they they not going. In. It's like the Browns. You know what I'm saying? I mean, somebody took the Browns and won with him. Somebody's gonna take that situation and, and find a way to, you know, you gotta just you gotta make it work. Thing though, the black coach ain't gonna get that long leash. The black head coach, you don't, you he don't get the long leash. He get a shorter leash. And this takes me. This takes me back to my to my point before. You can't go in there trying to be like somebody else. You got to have your own personality, style, way you're going to do things to get things done right now. You do not have the same opportunity. You have to be honest with yourself. You have to know that you don't have the same opportunity. You don't got four or five years. You got right now, today. I mean, how I've all the, I told you about the high school programs that I took over. I treated those like people would have thought that we were Alabama. And, and Wayne's, you couldn't tell us nothing. I treated that thing like we were larger than life. I didn't tell them kids that it was a rebuilding year. Or we had time. I mean, I told them we're winning right now today. We're getting the conference championship. That's the minimum expectation this year. And people were looking at me like, you're crazy. I'm like, that's the minimum expectation. We got to win the conference. Like, in, in today's college football, do you think winning the in-state recruiting battle is key? I think recruiting in-state period is key from a standpoint of you want those high school head coaches, you know, to 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 believe in your program. You want to you want to sell that program to those high school head coaches in the area. I think, you know, with all the seven on seven guys and all the you know everything that goes on, I, you know, we became like AAU basketball and football now. I mean, that's really what that's really how football is kind of you know we're turning towards that tide. I, I think, think I think we're already there. I but, think seven on seven is a waste of time. Yeah, if you know not, what I'm saying. I do. If you're not running your high school offense, it's pointless. If you're playing seven on seven football and you're not playing with the guys you're gonna play in the regular season, you're playing with a bunch of all stars. It's pointless because y'all ain't gonna play together when the season starts. And seven on seven is to develop camaraderie. You know what I'm saying? That's all seven on seven is to develop camaraderie and make your team competitive. But if you're playing with the best guy from this team, the best guy from that team, the guy who called him the plays ain't calling plays that none of y'all going to run in the regular season, it's pointless. Yeah. It's I, I think that 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 stuff is kind of like like you're saying. I mean, it's it's good to to get that exposure. You know, if you say you're on a like an elite basketball team, the EYBL circuit, if you're on that EYBL circuit, you get to go play if I'm. Kobe Bryant and I get to go play LeBron James, you know, that I wouldn't be able to do that in high school on my high school team. I think that's, that's good opportunity, good exposure. But like you're saying, I mean, it's got to the point where it's like guys are creating super teams, not playing for their own high school team. You know, like it, you're and doing, you're doing too much. Problem. The man who making up the plays, these plays would not work in a real football game. I don't care what you're talking about. Yeah. People and laughed at me when we came out there with our two backs side by side and running our, Faking our play action game and all that. I'm like, I'm well, running. You, the faking the hit 
you can't even run. Why, why are you doing that? Yeah. I'm like, I'm running the same plays that we run in the game. I ain't coming out here and uh, creating no, designing no plays to beat y'all. I ain't worried about y'all like that. It ain't yeah. that serious. Seven on seven football. The only people that should play seven on seven football and take it serious is old people like us that's washed up and <laughs> live our glory years. Kids, because listen, listen, I'm a firm believer in this. It's all about growth and development. Every year you got to grow and develop better, right? That's how you're going to go to college. That's how you're going to get better. But if you're not, if you're not being groomed or these, these people you playing seven on seven will have no affiliation with your high school. Don't care nothing about you. All they worried about is getting you on a team so they can win. Man, it's pointless. Yeah. And, and if you get hurt doing seven on seven, God forbid you get hurt. Now we got a whole nother can of worms to deal with. I just feel like seven on seven football, it should be you playing with your teammates. Yeah. Y'all go and play the best kids. I have well, seen the, only thing, the only thing that I, I support the seven on seven coaches on is the guys that actually get the kids exposed. And most of those guys are actually high school coaches. You know what I'm saying? The guys that I know that have that have done well for seven on seven and they've been in it for since it started, they're actually high school football coaches at the same time. You know what I mean? They're, this 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 my take on exposure. Right. So I, I feel like that seven on seven exposure, yeah. Okay, whatever. But the best exposure a kid can get is when he go to a school Friday night like camp. That's your moment to shine. Yeah. So forget seven on seven. Find somebody to train you. Find somebody to make you into the best person that you can be at that position. Because when you go to them schools Friday night like camp, man, you can walk in there or nobody and walk out of somebody. Yeah. You can't. You can't yeah, because it's real football. Right. Yeah. So that's why I feel like seven on seven, yeah, it's okay. But find you a good trainer. Find you somebody like like I tell guys all the time, before we start training, I want to see where, where your skill set at. I want to see what you can do. Some guys is naturally high pointers. Some guys is naturally good route runners. So we want to look at your stuff so we can see what you don't do well. So like for me, when I work out quarterbacks, every time we throw – we throw to the left side first because that's your weakest side. I don't care about it. if you can't hit a five out a five and out on your right side, then you shouldn't be playing no way. So mm -hmm. let's work on your backside throws. Let's get that together. And then we'll come to the stuff that come natural. But a lot, a lot of people, they not, they I just don't think they 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 in it for the kids. Like you said, yeah. football, yeah. I mean, like, like you said, they're not not every no, there's not a lot of people that are in it for growth and development, right? They're they're in it for what right. type of what is type of stage it puts them on, right? Because they're gonna get right and they in it for saying I trained this kid, I coached this. Like we was talking about Patrick Mahomes, <laughs> right? Reed said he was a late developer, he was a late bloomer. And I'm thinking, like, nah, he just had to go through the full process at being a quarterback in college. You know mm -hmm. what I'm saying? A, a lot of people, when 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 a kid come in, let's be honest, at, at the quarterback, unless your butt Michael Vick. Coming out of high school, you probably gonna sit on the bench. Michael Vick had the red shirt. Yeah, but but they, they, when you coming <laughs> out, you gonna probably sit the bench because you're not that good. Yeah. So I just think like we we need move, especially with the kids. Let's focus more on growth and development because when you get the going to chase after exposure, you can be exposed as a bomb just as well. Yeah. You can you can because it's not it's no way for them to unsee what you did, and so you got to make sure that you're on point. Coach so that's Mar what I'm when you chasing exposure. When you chasing exposure, you got to be careful of what kind of exposure you chasing. You can be exposed as a stud, or you can be exposed as a bus. I know a guy who paid a guy from twenty four seven rivals to increase his kids' stars. Right. So I tell the dude, I say, Yo, if if you pay the dude. If you pay the dude, it's going to blow up in your face because your son not that good to begin with. It's a reason why he not getting an offer to Ohio State. And yeah. it ain't because the coach hating on him, bro. Yeah. So he he paid the dude. The dude get his star game up. The man go to a camp at Ohio State. The boy wasn't on the field four plays before the coach said, get him off. Now he done. The only thing that's – the only thing as from a college football – college coach standpoint that can trump your actual game film is if you are like six 
eight and can do backflips and dunk and just be yeah. some, you know, like just a freak athlete. That's the only thing that can trump your game, your actual game film. So, like you said, a lot of people spend so much time in seven on seven where you should be lifting, training, getting yourself right to put on a show when it's Friday. Because that's what you're going to get looked at. You're going to look at what you do on Friday. Ain't nobody watching seven on seven film. Now, there is coaches in seven on seven where you go, okay, well, if he's got this kid that he's probably decent, let me check out his game film. I'm still going to go back to his game film at the end of the day, no matter what. You got to go back to that actual film. So why do you think why do you think some coaches put a lot of emphasis on stars? Like why do you think that is? I think that's more of a fan base, uh, you know, a, 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 a profile. I think that's more of that situation and scenario than it is a actual coaches are focused on that, if that makes sense. You know what I'm saying? I think that, you know, if you want to be known as the the number one recruiter, you know, you got to get all five stars or all four stars, you know, that makes you, but then if those dudes come in and they can't play, my, my, my thing you about replaced as a coach, you know, at the end of the day, if you the people you bring in can't, can't play, can't ball, it don't matter what they start level was. My, 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 my thing about the, when I, when I, when I hear somebody say a kid is a five star kid, I think that's a bad thing. And the reason I say that, that, that you basically saying, this kid is topped out at us as a senior in high school. He's not going to get no better. So I, I feel like we should be real, real careful when we start talking about this kid is a five star. This kid is a four star because you really don't know what you got with a kid until you get him on campus and you put him in there with some juniors and seniors that's been in the program three, four years. Yeah, so that's when you can say, eh, he going to work out. Oh, he might not. Or he got potential. You know what I mean? Yeah. I, I, I just think that and I feel like. I feel like stars should be taken out the equation. And the only thing that should matter is what you do against top tier competition. Yeah. That's what I, mean, I very few players that like, for example, I'm from Pittsburgh. So like Tyler Boyd, right. He starts for the Bengals. You know, he played against single A competition. I mean, it was just like, I mean, I think the dude had like a hundred touchdowns once. I mean, it was ridiculous. Terrell Pryor, same thing. Right, the, the big quarterback that switched oh, three seasons. Yeah, Ohio State. Right, he played against nobody. I mean, the dude was out there had like forty sacks. I mean, he scored every time he got the ball. It was like he ain't playing nobody. Right, but you just have to project as a coach. Like, if it's just like I watched the thing on uh, Pete Carroll the other day about Reggie Bush. He said I just kept watching the film. And I'm going like he's just scoring every time. I don't know how good he is because the kids he's playing against. Right, you, you know what I'm saying. And sometimes if you're that kid, then maybe you need to go play that seven on seven or something to show like I can dominate them kids too. You know, like I can dominate the top tier talent too, you know, but there's, I mean, every situation is unique. Like you said, I just don't think there's really that much. I mean, people go like all out for seven on seven. And like you said, a lot of those coaches just don't want to do the paperwork to become a high school head coach or, you know, actually they're really trying to do it for themselves and create a team for their son or, you know, trying to get somebody, you know, they're trying to do something for themselves more than they are for the kids. Because if you were really about the kids, you would do the necessary steps to go and actually be, you know, a, a real trainer, a real coach, you know, all those things. Coach, I got a question for you. Because I, this is something I've always wondered. What is the, you had the University of Hawaii, right? What's the recruiting footprint of the University of Hawaii? I know they got some they got a couple well-known high school programs out there nationally, but are you guys primarily Hawaii kids? Are you primarily on the West Coast? What if a kid from the Midwest or down South wanted to play in Hawaii? Would that even be feasible? Would you guys even look at that? What's kind of your recruiting footprint at Hawaii? Right now, I mean, this year we've been, I mean, we've got kids from Florida, Texas, Pennsylvania, uh, Hawaii. I mean, California. I mean, so it's kind of like Hawaii is unique in the fact that you have to find somebody who loves football enough to go five hours from the edge of, you know what I mean? From California, it's a five hour flight from California. So wherever you're at, say I'm from Pennsylvania, that's a five hour flight to California or a six hour flight, then another five hour flight to Hawaii. Right. Mm -hmm. So you got to find kids that really want to come out here. Right. Is it a hard sale to convince a kid to go to college in Hawaii? No, once they're here, I mean, they love it. But it's just, the, you know, the parent, you know, that's my baby all the way out in Hawaii. 
I mean, we got we got a lot of kids from Texas this year. Like I said, we got a kid from Pennsylvania, from Philly, uh, that I coached. You know, so it, it's like we got kids from from far far distances, but at the same time, it has to be that rapport and respect between the coach and the, and the family to get the kid to come. You know, so far. But Is once it, you're here, I mean, you're in paradise when you're here. I mean. Oh, the last thing I want to ask you before we get out of here um, is this. I watch a lot of college football. I, I got really close relationships with a lot of college football coaches. I see a lot of people that can't move the ball. I see a lot of struggling offenses out there. All right. I'm a head coach at a Division One school. Why should I hire Brennan Marion to be the OC? And what would his go-go offense bring for me and my program? It would always give you an opportunity to drive the ball down the field and score in a lot of explosive plays where a two-back power run play action shot team uh, with a triple option element where our quarterback can get us out of bad plays. It doesn't matter from a personnel standpoint. We're always going to put the ball in a position to score and put it in our best player's hand versus the, the lesser players on the team. We operate faster than anybody in the country. We have elite discipline on, on how we do things, um, and, and that's kind of what separates us from – from other offenses around the, around the country. We're something different. So every defense coordinator is going to have to prepare differently. If you look at college football right now, it's a, it's a big copy and paste. Everybody runs the same thing. Trips. It's really easy to prepare for the same thing. Now when you play us, they're going to have to com- prepare for a completely different offense, right? And you have five days to do that. You have three days really to get the kids ready to see a completely different offense that they have not seen and that's one of the things that give you an element and, and, and give you something that is different, right? It give you something different that gives you an opportunity to to go and put points up. I mean, you look at it with from a standpoint of I've averaged over 30 points a game in, in college at the three stops that I've been at. And all those teams were under. Uh, William Mary was 13 points a game before I got there and Howard was 17 points a game and we went to 30, you know, so you get an opportunity to, to have somebody has a proven track record of doing more with less um, and putting points up on the board. Now, guys, we want, I want to thank you, Brennan, for coming on. You know, I get asked all the time by people about the disparity um, between African-American coaches getting opportunities, whether it's head coaching jobs, whether it's coordinator jobs. And I've been very adamant, you know, to, to some, uh, that we need opportunities. We need guys need to be given opportunities to GA. Guys need to be given opportunities to be position coaches and, and, and get an analyst and some of those entry level things in the college football. Um, whether it's at the Power Five level, the Group of Five, FCS, Division Two, um, getting guys an entry level in the in the game. I would tell any athletic administrator, any president, any AD that if you really want to know. Um, what black coaches can move your program, call me, because I can give you some names of some guys who can uh, change your program. Brendan Marion is definitely one of those guys. you got Norvell McKenzie at Vanderbilt, Brad Davis at Arkansas, Garrett McGee at Florida, Trey Scott at Georgia, Curtis Looper at Mizzou, Ryan Walters and Corey Patterson at Illinois, Marcus Freeman just took over as the D.C. at Notre Dame, Kenny Burns at Minnesota, LeVar Woods at Iowa, Coach Springer at Northwestern, Chris Barkley at Purdue, Antonio Pierce at Arizona State, D.K. McDonald at Iowa State, Calvin Thibodeau and Jamar Kane at Oklahoma. We got a variety of guys, offensive guys, defensive guys that can turn around the program. Let's get these guys some opportunities, all right, so we can uh, get some diversity at the upper levels of college football. Guys, this is the Run Up to Score podcast. Keep working. Appreciate you guys. Thank you. All right, my brother. All right now.